we will be recording this meeting. Hope that is okay with you. And again, welcome to our West Valley People's Alliance monthly general meeting. Welcome to the Gregorian New Year. Um, we'd love to get to know each other. So if you're comfortable, please introduce yourself in the chat with your name, organization, if you have one. We love independence. So if you're not a part of an organization, that's fine. And the city or neighborhood you're in, I'm up in Santa Clarita right now, but I'm a Valley boy. Uh, if you can just put that in the chat, appreciate that. Before we get started, let's just do the land acknowledgement, right? The land that we are on today is the original land of the Chumash people, the Fernandino Tatavian people and native people from across the region. Just like to recognize that at the start of these meetings. Let's get into it. So this last year, well, it's been one of the most intense years of our lifetime, or at least my lifetime. And the last few days have been very emotional for some of us, numbing for some, and how you feel is how you feel, and it's valid. We want this space to be positive, encouraging, and a constructive vehicle for us to channel our energy towards positive action. We know people are decompressing, and hopefully this meeting will help us move forward together. We have a special guest today who brings an important perspective and has been doing the work on the ground. It's my pleasure to introduce Reverend Eddie Anderson, who's a senior pastor at McCarty Church, a community organizer with LA Voice, and he's the former co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. We had originally asked him here to help us honor the work of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and share information about the Poor People's Campaign revival. Then Georgia happened. <laughs> I'm still uh, hesitant about Joe Manchin, but that was a victory. And then depending on your perspective, you know, we had this attempted coup, treasonous riot, however you want to label it, it happened and it was got, it's got people feeling all sorts of ways. So we asked Reverend Anderson to help us work through all the complex feelings folks are going through this week and help us shed light and uh, lessons from the legacy of MLK and other movements to help us move forward. We're so grateful to have Reverend Eddie Anderson with us today and in this moment. So Reverend Anderson, please take over and share. Thank you, Ankur, and good morning, everyone. A special good morning to Pilar, who uh, reached out to me, and Amario as part of this group, and all of you uh, for having me this morning uh, at this critical inflection point uh, of our nation. And that sounds a little cliche, because it seems like if you live through 2020, there's been a lot of inflection points uh, in our nation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Poor People's Campaign, but I want to give some context and then hopefully we'll get into current events as well. Uh, so, um, 1967 is, seems like not that long ago, uh, Dr. King and Reverend Lawson and others uh, were sitting around a the table. They had just, you know, got a, a Voting Rights Act. They have just got off a high of seeing so many human rights and especially rights for black people, people of color get passed when they were sitting in a room and they were wondering what is the spirit? What is the universe calling us to do next? Uh, and it was to deal with the poor people's campaign to go to DC and bring those who've been dispossessed to the Capitol uh, to create uh, an encampment and to bring the broken promises of the nation to the Capitol. Many of you know, uh, just a year later, uh, two African-American uh, men who were sanitation workers were killed in Memphis and they wanted to get their rights. And Dr. King went down there and Poor, Poor People's Campaign never fully uh, materialized. But at that time, uh, they talked about triple evils, the evils of racism and uh, the war economy, the evil of poverty. And in 2017, uh, Reverend Dr. William Barber, uh, who was from North Carolina, you may know him uh, from the Moral Monday movement, uh, leader of NAACP, 
he got together with Reverend Lithia Harris and we created the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Uh, we call it a resurrection. It's not uh, a revitalization, it's a resurrection. We went down to the place where Dr. King was killed and we said, uh, that's right, Aaron, we got to fight uh, poverty and not the poor. Then we reached down into the blood of where Dr. King was assassinated, where they tried to kill a movement to say the movement is still alive and well, that yes, we still are fighting systematic poverty. We believe there's over 140 million uh, low wealth and poor people in our country that we still have to fight racism. If you don't believe systematic racism is real, 2020 should have opened your eyes if you wasn't woke already. If you wasn't woke from uh, Trayvon Martin, if you wasn't woke from Tamir Rice, if you wasn't woke from Sandra Bland, then definitely George Floyd uh, being uh, executed and lynched in public, definitely uh, seeing our sister Brianna Taylor sleeping and getting shot to death and killed and no charges have been filed in either case. Definitely Ahmaud Aubrey running uh, through the neighborhood and being lynched by uh, angry white, white supremacist, a mob who feels so entitled, you know systematic racism is still an issue. We, so we're fighting systematic racism, we're fighting uh, poverty, we're fighting the ecological devastation because we know that our climate is heating up uh, and we got to do uh, uh, something about it and we're fighting uh, the war economy because we know that our military gets on about $700 billion a year, it seems like, and yet uh, we are still not safe, that we are actually more threat threatened uh, than ever. And we sat together and we said that the fifth uh, evil that we have to fight, and that is the distorted moral narrative. And I just want to talk about the distorted moral narrative a little bit, because I believe when you look at what happened this week, you can see that one of the greatest threats, existential threats to our nation, is a distorted moral narrative. It's a moral narrative that is rooted in the founding of America. The founding of America, which said that by manifest destiny, that we can go and take the lands of native people. We can steal my ancestors from the shores of Africa. We can make them three-fifths human and they are not fully people because power in electoral college is more important than people's human rights. And that we can bring them here and God has made us, us being white people, us being uh, Puritans and Christians of that time, us more important than some others. That it is our birthright in many ways to do this, to pursue this, to build this nation. That moral narrative never left America. And so what I would say is that what we saw in 2020 was this moral narrative be uh, underlined and highlighted for us. That this distorted moral narrative has allowed for George Floyd to be killed just like so many of his ancestors before him who were lynched, who were uh, tarred and feathered, who were shackled who continue to be disenfranchised to be killed on national television and not one charge to be applied. This distorted moral narrative can say that uh, a person like Donald Trump can say, stand forth and walk across the street in the middle, tear gas people who are out there protesting, doing their first amendment right, hold a Bible upside down. And because he's holding a Bible, somehow he's right. This distorted moral narrative says that during a pandemic, that testing is not a priority and getting people vaccines was not the priority because healthcare isn't a human right. This distorted moral narrative has fed into our nation and it is very American. It's American, well, apple pie really isn't American, but we say American as apple pie. And so when on Wednesday, Folks show up in the Capitol and do an insurrection led by the president of our nation who goes out and tells them we're going to march down the street to the Capitol, that we have to stop this voter fraud and every court in the land says there's no voter fraud. After every recount, I'm, I'm originally from Georgia, which had three recounts 
<laughs> there's no voter fraud, but yet we can march down because it is our birthright. White privilege mixed with capitalism is a death sentence for our nation. And it has been a death sentence for our nation since the beginning and founding of our nation because it dehumanizes everyone involved and it makes God a tool for oppression. And so what we saw on Wednesday was people living out their quote unquote birthright. It was white privilege personified. It was terrorism, the same terrorism that the KKK executed, the same terrorism that settlers came executed on Native Americans, that same terrorism which we saw through slavery and Jim Crow and Jane Crow and through Disability Ability Act. That narrative says it's our country. I won't forget watching that video and seeing a woman walking stage uh, into the Capitol and say, we're home as if she has the right to break every law in the book and take over the Capitol. This was not, how did we get here? It, we've always been here, but there's always been enough of us, as Dr. King said, who are people of goodwill, who know that the time is always right to do right, who are maladjusted to evil, and who stand up and say, not anymore not in our name. Our nation has become tone deaf to the evil. Poverty is a symptom of this evil. How is it in quote unquote, one of the richest nations that ever existed, we could have 140 million people before the pandemic in poverty. How is it that during the pandemic, poor and low wealth people couldn't find testing and African Americans were disproportionately affected at the beginning of the pandemic. And in Los Angeles alone in East Los Angeles, which is majorly a Latinx or Latino uh, uh, area, one in five people, the LA Times says, has been affected by COVID. How is it that those who were sleeping outside are allowed to come inside for a short period of time, but now are facing the, the, the reality that they may find themselves back on the streets, but there's not enough vaccines to make sure everybody is safe? How is it that we get here? Is it when we feed into a distorted moral narrative, we compound the evils of militarism and oppression and police brutality. We compound the evils of poverty, we compound the evils of systematic racism, and we compound the evils of ecological devastation, all of which we have seen in 2020. Just look at the fires in Australia, the fires in California, look at the hurricanes and that came through Memphis and all of the Gulf Coast, look at the world. We can see the world calling out to us and saying, do you care? We can see black people and brown people calling out to us and saying, do you care? And yet on Wednesday, we saw all that is America. We woke up to the news that a Jewish man and a black preacher will be senators from Georgia. Never have you seen such a thing. And as the day progressed, we saw the other side of America the America we've all known that there's always been two Americas, storm the Capitol, fly a Confederate flag in the Capitol, which we have not seen even during the Civil War. We saw nooses and gallows and crosses erected as an ode to that which we thought had left but has always been present among us. And the question for us in the Poor People's Campaign says, do you believe that everybody still has a right to live? Do you believe that somebody has been hurting our brothers and sisters far too long and it can't go on anymore? Do you believe that we can be a new and unsettling force in our nation to call us back to conscience? Dr. King says, it only takes a few, few people of goodwill and conscience to realize that we need to sweep away the injustice, that we need to use water, the water of righteousness, the water of justice, to sweep away the things 
that try to enchapel us to remind ourselves that we truly are weaved together in a garment of mutual destiny. Do we believe it? That's what the Poor People's Campaign has been doing. Uh, that's what uh, I hope all of you all continue to do. I know you all will do. Poor People's Campaign, look at the website, poorpeoplescampaign.org. Right now, you will see that there's 14 policy priorities to help heal the nation as we move forward. Uh, we invite you, we're in 40, all 50 states now. We're in all 50 states in, in Brazil and other places as well. Um, and we invite you to join us because what we saw in Memphis, what we learned in the 60s, what we saw in 2020, uh, when we saw people get together, that change is possible if we come together. If we listen to those who back the bend against the wall, and when Black people say Black Lives Matter, we listen. When poor people say we need health care, we listen. We need, a, we need a, a living wage and not just an affordable wage, we listen. And when we listen, change can happen. Right here in LA, Measure J passed because we went around and we said, everybody deserves the right to live. It's, it's unconscionable not to prioritize those who've been oppressed. So Measure J can pass so we can have a new DA who on his first day said, we are doing away with the death penalty. We are doing away with gang enhancements. We're doing away with bail in Los Angeles because that criminalizes poverty and we need to fight poverty and not the poor. Do you believe that we can make this change? I know you all do. And so I'll be quiet and invite you all. What comes up for you in this moment? Do you believe that you can be an angelic troublemaker, a person for the common good of our nation? Turn it back over to Ankar and Pilar, and thank you all for being here with me and free to answer any questions on the Portuguese campaign or current movements as well. Thank you, Reverend Eddie. I see you go by your first name sometimes. I love it. That was a beautiful, you know, pretty concise, but you, you told the whole arc, that distorted moral narrative that you elaborated on is so important. I'm, I really appreciate you highlighting it. And one of the best ways to challenge that narrative is with our own stories, our own feelings, right? We don't have a lot of time, but we like to hear you share. We want to listen. If you're willing and want to share, um, put your hand up, put your name in stack. Uh, we can turn off recording if you prefer to share without being recorded, but let's open it up. We have a little bit of time. I, as Reverend Eddie said, he's that's why we're here. Who'd like to go? Let me try and facilitate this. Anybody in stack? Anybody raise a hand? I think if anyone wants to just unmute themselves and speak, they can, or people can put stack into the chat and we'll keep track that way. So based on how you're feeling, right? Just share. And if you want to touch, elaborate on, or uh, your reflection on re what Reverend Eddie says, how you're feeling, just let's get it out there because it's been such a complicated time. Uh, just like to hear more voices, right? We want to use this space for community building so that we can challenge this distorted narrative with our narrative. So please, I've already spoken enough. I think if people want to also think about like how, you know, how we move forward in this moment, because I think sometimes it can be overwhelming and, um, you know, and disempowering and, um, you know, and I think it's important to remember, you know, just us as an organization, what we've built in a short period of time, just starting up in June um, and have been able to have a big impact in an area where it's really needed, you know, where some of the folks who were in DC taking over the Capitol have friends here or were there from here, right? We've got those Capitol occupiers living right here in the West Valley with us. And there's a lot of work for us to do specifically here. Um, and, you know, for me personally, I think, you know, I've been in organizing for over 20, for 20 years and um, what a lot of my friends or family will, you know, like jump into politics a little bit and then 
get defeated about something and kind of step out of it. And, um, you know, and I've had conversations with people about how you kind of keep going. And I think one of the things that really helps me, at least personally, keep going is that you don't feel so powerless when you're involved in the movement, when you're fighting for justice, when you're on the ground, um, trying to make a difference. But when you, you know, when you have to just kind of be a passive observer and watch all of this stuff unfold and feel like you can't do anything about it, it, it can be really overwhelming. Um, and so, you know, so for me, it just feels like um, it reinforces the need for us to you know, redouble our efforts here, build our local movement, um, and continue to grow and, and fight for justice in the West Valley and, and all of LA. Um, and I see a couple of folks are on stack. Yeah, thank you, Pilar, for getting people uh, into it. It looks like we'll have Michelle go first. Hello, thank you. Can you guys all hear me okay? Thank you, Rev. Um, that was awesome. And I, you know, will share my story uh, quickly as it relates to this and to hopefully give you a little bit of, of hope. Um, I uh, didn't know anything about anything, according to politics, uh, before Donald Trump was elected. And uh, I thought, you know, I have black friends. I was one of those. I, you know, we all have equal choices and things like that. And I used to tell, you know, my husband, I'm like, okay, who are we voting for? Like, who's Diane Feinstein? And he's just like horrified. He's like, do not tell anybody that you don't know that. So I tell everybody because I think the context is very important. And I think it's time that white people really reckon with their own hand in supporting and upholding structural racism. And we can do it. And uh, when Donald Trump got elected, I was horrified. And I was like, oh my God, this is how people of color have felt forever. I, I, you know, and I struggled. I came from corporate America and I left and I became a full-time activist and just midlife, like this is what I'm doing now. And I just surrounded myself with, with the organizers, asked a lot of questions and it just really stayed focused on the goal and whatever goal was in front of me. And um, it, it was the best decision of my life. And it's like, um, uh, you know, you're the, what are the two important days in your life, the day you were born and then the day you found out why. And the night that Donald Trump got elected was the day that I found out why. And there was no guarantees. And I went full all in. I ran Northridge Indivisible and also part of Field Team 6, one of their state digital organizers. I built coalitions across California and the country. And um, what I saw on uh, you know, going through this the last four years, I, I, it was exhausting. And I didn't realize, you know, once they announced um, Biden won, I took a nap, little nap and I did not realize how exhausted I was. And, um, but I, it was like my honor. And I'm like, you know what? People of color have been doing this for 500 years. I can handle four years and I can handle four more years and then four more after that. And then, you know, until I, in my time is done. But, um, you know, you go and you go and you go and then you realize, you know, oh, we have this loss. Okay, well, that's okay. Like, we're going to have losses. That's fine. But we're going to keep going. Because you don't just do one thing and we're going to, okay, good, I did my little part. No, it's not comfortable. It's hard. And it's messy. And it's sloppy. And it's awesome. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, uh, when I saw the, the event happening on Wednesday, yes, I was horrified, but I was also hopeful because we are making progress. They would not be fighting that hard if we weren't making progress. And we need to just keep our eye on the goal there and focus on what is our goal and keep going, figure out what your cadence is whether it's a minute a week or an hour a week. We have all the power. Don't ever forget that. Um, I'm not sure when I'm supposed to inject our slate thing. I can do that later, but I wanted to respond to the Reverend and um, I'm with you. And I and your words are just really uh, just very impactful. 
So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you for your nonstop cadence. We met back when I was running for state assembly and I appreciated that whole process of bringing people in. And, and we gotta be not afraid to lose, right? We have to compete at all levels, otherwise we will lose. And so appreciate you putting yourself out there. Next we have, is it Mr. Klein? Uh, yeah, let's go with Joshua Klein. Berg, yeah, Kleinberg. But yeah, Kleinberg. hi everybody. Um, it's all right, hi guys. Um, you know, ever you know since the um, since the event on Wednesday, I you know I, I agree with with Reverend Eddie and I agree with Michelle. Um, you know, people do have to reckon with you know these internal um, feelings and uh, thought processes that lead to well, like. Well, I have black friends, you know, everyone, I like everybody, you know, but, but like, you know, why can't we all just like get along and then like, just move past all of this, like, but and the thing is, you just get into like this culture war argument, and it just, it just never ends. Every, everything that just, you say, well, you say like, well, look at, you know, the people storming the capital, well, then like, what about BLM, you know, burning down buildings? Well, I think it's, it's not really that simple because you can't, it, but it just never stops and you can't get away from it. And I don't know how you, you know, talk to people to try and re have them realize something that I don't think is intuitive for them, like because of the, um, because of the society, you know, we were all born in, it, it just doesn't allow for that kind of thought to begin it, it, it just there's just thought walls basically and you know my, my personal opinion is i think just people need to just openly talk with other people that like just you know and integrate you know i uh you know for a while i didn't realize that i you know had those kinds of feelings and thoughts and it just, but then I, after Michael Brown, you know, I talked with BLM people, you know, in the first beginning, and I was like, oh, wow, this is real. Okay. I can't ignore it. This is a real problem. After Tamir Rice, and uh, it, it just, but I don't know how you get that. I don't know how you translate that for other people. It's just really hard. Thanks. Thank you, Joshua, for sharing. Uh, next, let's go to Melanie. Good morning, everybody. My name's Mel, uh, uh, and I'm so happy to be here. I really want to thank uh, Pilar and everybody who uh, continually sets this up and does all the great work in the West Valley. I really appreciate you guys. I I'm my New Year's goal is to attend as much as possible. I know my work schedule has uh, restricted me very much in the past. Um, and uh, Reverend Eddie, you know, I really loved everything that you had to share. I think that um, not only are your words inspiring, but they're very much along the truth. So uh, to hear it in in your very animated way is um, uh, really moved me. Um, and um, yeah, I, I I guess I wanted uh, to share um, because, well, um, everything that happened on Wednesday was ho uh, horrible. You know, horrible on, on every ground, uh, and it's exhaust. I mean, it's exhausting. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, but I, especially for uh, minorities of co uh, you know people of color, and uh, you know to um, you know uh, because there's so so much. Uh, oh, you know. Black Lives Matter, well, they looted and, you know, and, and uh, to sit, uh, you know, I, I like to sit and explain to them, you know, every chance I get, because I think that, uh, you know, uh, even if it's just setting a seed, you know, um, from my experience, uh, you know, people that I've set a seed will like come back three years later and be like, you know what, like, 
at the time I was, you know, ob objecting and, and I sat and learned from it. So you never know where the seed's going to be planted and some, and you may never see the change, you know, but, but I still like to, I think, encourage everybody to take the opportunity um, because, you know, uh, when Black Lives Matter um, and as an ally, will we say, you know, it's said to, um, you know, it's fighting for, it's fighting for the uh, right, the existence Essential right for uh, people of color to exist um, it, with freedom and liberty and to be able to express uh, themselves and also the institution of the police, the military institution also, um, you know, uh, like murders, you know, and gets away with it. And that's really what it is. It's, you know, it's not the, it's not comparable at all to, you know, a bunch of crazies, like QAnon conspiracy theorists, um, believing that, you know, whatever, the election was stolen or whatever they think, you know, it's so, uh, it's definitely, so I, uh, you know, I think, uh, I just wanted to give um, my my support and solidarity, and you know, if you're exhausted, like big hugs. You know, you're you're doing, you know, we're making the world for a better place for the next generation. And um, the the next thing I was gonna say, um, because uh, in my um, in the last month, well, two months actually, but doesn't matter. Uh, I've been reading a lot of, um, you know, like, like Karl Marx, like uh, Communist Manifesto and Das Capital and things like that. And, um, um, you know, and Lenin's works and anyways, uh, Trotsky, you know, um, uh, but any who's doozies, uh, what I found, um, because, you know, I wanted to, to state, you know, like, in, a, in addition to this, uh, this, America was, you know, has been such an extreme capitalist society, but most of the capital gained was through slave labor, which the reparations have never been offered. So, um, and so that's, uh, you know, um, kind of like Karl Marx's opening line where it's like, you know, the, the workers, uh, I think, um, and I think Malcolm X talked a little bit about this, but um, I could be, um, you know, forgetting some details, but essentially it's like, you know, we really need to revolutionize all of America so that everybody starts at zero, you know, that's the only way it'll, it'll be fair, um, because uh, when you have older white families who have these riches, you know, so I think it's all very intersectional, and that's what I want to say, that it's, uh, we, we definitely need to change, and, and I, and I totally believe on change at the local level, so thank you guys for uh, everything you do, and uh, okay, have a good morning. Thank you, Mel, that was, that was good, that was beautiful. We have one more person on stack and then we're gonna give it back to Reverend Eddie to give some reflections and closing thoughts. I think uh, Caleb probably has some some good points that he wants to, to make. Caleb? I will be very brief, but uh, yeah, Reverend Eddie, thank you for being here and thank you for sharing the space with us and, and bringing some, some grounding for us today. I know it was a crazy last week and lots of folks are reeling. Um, I think what struck me and what has always sort of struck me about the poor people's campaign and a lot about what you were talking about Reverend Eddie is this call for a moral revival and I think what we often see playing out I know many folks in this call I know folks there's some folks who are also new to the work of the movement in ways um, but what you will start to see is many people who have lots of power don't really answer the call the moral call right but what's really beautiful about the movement that's what really shakes and moves all of us and i think that's what we what we see and what keeps us in it and what keeps us going is knowing that like we do care about that and we do feel it and we are impacted and so that's sort of what the ties that bind us um but the other thing i was just thinking because lots of folks are talking about this and i know that especially right now it it just feels very intense and very precarious about what is to come um, but i think it's in those moments where it's more important than ever to continue the work and to push and, and to get involved. You know, Pilar talked about this earlier, feeling it's being in the work that I think makes us feel something. Like it takes, I think it really sort of like takes care of that like helpless or like hopeless feeling that oftentimes you can feel when you're not doing organizing work or community building work. And I just wanted to say quickly, like a good example of something that felt so amazing to me is like, you know, three or four years ago, we were running a campaign for Jessica Salons and CD13. You look at something that happened with Nithia this year 
and I do not say this to pretend as if electoral politics is the answer or the antidote to everything. It is not, it will never be whole ass other conversation we could <laughs> have, but, um, but it's exciting to see what the movement can do, right? Like that is one tactic, that is one thing that we can do. And just, yes, it took years, but like, that was years of us coming together as a community and as family and like learning how to do it and learning where the resources are and getting it done. And so I'm excited to see like what else is going to happen with you folks like in the West Valley and in these years to come. And I'll stop there because I know Reverend Andrew has got a lot more things to say, but yeah. Yeah, thank you, Caleb. Reverend? Yeah, I mean, thank you for your the reflections. And I think in the chat, a lot of questions around how do we talk to people who may be totally different? And, and one thing I'll say about the Corpus campaign and just movement work in general and Dr. King's legacy is that it, what, it really was not rooted in um, you gotta be a Democrat or Republican, right? It's this deeper understanding that there are some things that are right and some things that are wrong morally or that, that we know truths about our humanity, right? Uh, the Constitution, uh, you know, the preamble to the Constitution says we have like inalienable rights, you know, and, you know, we can't pursue liberty or life uh, if we're not even considered fully human. And when we deny people rights, you know, health care or a good paying job or the dignity of walking down the street and not being accosted because your skin is too dark. Um, and that's wrong, right? It's not like a Democrat or Republican issue. That's like right or wrong issues. So that's the first thing I'll say is um, stick to the facts as well, right? Like all of us have a core and we know what it felt, what it feels like to be treated with respect and dignity. And when you talk to other people, just ask them, you know, do you think that action brought respect and dignity to everyone involved? If the answer is no, then we have to have a deeper conversation around how do we thrive towards this, this justice? You know, Dr. King is famous for is famously quoted for saying that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And oftentimes you will hear activists say it only bends towards justice if we bend it, right? And, and that's true. They both are true. Uh, that we have to continue to say there's there's facts and numbers. And I know we've lived in a four year time period where we had fake news and alternative facts or lies that are you know, sheltered as truth, but numbers are numbers, right? When you look at death tolls, you can look at numbers who disproportionately affected. When you look at the thing that was angry about Wednesday, you know, I saw a news report and it was talking about numbers and it was like, I think they said like 68 people got arrested. And it was, it's triggering because I got arrested at the Capitol with Poor People's Campaign for being within a thousand feet of the Capitol, right? Like you, you can't get to the Capitol, right? And so it was infuriating to say like, okay, so 68 people got arrested when they literally damaged federal property and broke into a building. When people walk down the street, 400,000 people get arrested. What do you think is at play here, right? Have those conversations about what is, what, what at the core of your humanity do you think is happening? And then go from there, I think is one way to enter these conversations, um, to stick to the facts. You know, Dr. Barber always says, don't be loud and wrong, know your numbers, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and know the stories because more than numbers, stories matter. And all of you have a story around a time where maybe you fell short, right? Like if you come into an argument and you, you, know, you just think you know, your perspective is always right, it's a turn off, right? But if you come in and say like, I haven't always had this perspective, but here's my journey, what's yours? Uh, that also brings in uh, uh, some kind of reconciliation. And then the other is your life. You know, this is maybe preachy for you, but your life is your testimony. Uh, and uh, Dr. King, you know, one of his last sermons talked about the drum major instinct. And um, in that sermon, the most beautiful part of that sermon to me um, is that he says that if you are a street sweeper, then sweep streets like Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, right? Basically saying 
do your part and be the best that you can at what God has given you. And know that that will impact others. Uh, and so don't say uh, to yourself, I'm not good enough, or I'm not a person of color, I'm not a leader, uh, I don't have that many followers on Twitter or Facebook or on Instagram. That, that doesn't matter. It's how are you every day asking yourselves, what am I doing to move humanity forward? What am I doing to improve my life? And who am I telling of my story to? Because as you share your stories, as you look at the facts, as you treat other people as humans, it, it pricks their heart as well, I believe, to be human as well uh, and, and to work together. And when you work together, we can all lift up the world. So that would be my encouragement to all of you all. That's how we solve homelessness. That's how we <laughs> change society. That's how the revolution is tele it's not televised, but it's made live. You know, as Gil Scott Heron says, that's how the revolution becomes real because it's the revolution of your values, which inspires the values of others. Beautiful. Thank you, Reverend Eddie. It has been a pleasure. I hope you can, I know you have something else that you got to get to. We appreciate you taking the time and giving us your perspective and sharing. Thank you everyone for sharing. We still got a whole program, half a program left. And, you know, we're here to correct that distorted moral narrative. And we know we can do that through caring for each other. Uh, and we're doing the work to make this place, this country, reflective of our moral morals and values. And there are many ways to do this, right? And we like to leave you with actions and things to do with the West Valley People's Alliance and how we're working and building. And one of the structures, or several structures, we got committees uh, working on a lot of these different issues, regularly meeting. Pilar, do you want to make a, a, a comment, a pitch for that right now? Get people plugged in? Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, you know, um, being able to be involved, being a part of the movement um, is sometimes the best therapy. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, we hope that folks will get involved, um, get more involved at the local level and be a part of the West Valley People's Alliance. Um, we have broken up into a committee structure to do the work of the organization. Um, so we have committees on housing and homelessness, racial justice, environmental justice, and transportation. Um, and we're, we're getting the uh, EJ uh, committee back up and running and communications and research we're going to be getting up and running as well. So um, Caleb just dropped the link to be able to sign up. If you haven't already and want to, please do. Um, we have our uh, housing and homelessness meeting happens this week at five. Racial justice happens, it's this Wednesday at five. Racial justice is next Wednesday at five and they alternate. Um, and then the environmental justice and transportation is gonna start meeting the first and third Monday of every month starting in February. Um, and that will be at 7.30, I believe. So we'll be emailing everybody about that. Um, but you know we've been able to you know have organized great events um organize actions organize responses to you know stop bad legislation or support good stuff that's happening and we're doing that all through our committees so we hope that you'll join up um sign up and come um and you know this wednesday at our racial justice committee meeting it was wednesday and we basically just took the whole hour to just process what was going on and support each other. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to build the community we want to be and that we need and, um, and we hope that you'll be a part of that too. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Again, please sign up for whichever committee makes sense for you where however you want to participate, right? Um, Reverend Anderson, you know, one of the questions he said, what, what's at the core of our humanity? And he tied it into, do we believe in our mutual destiny? Are we woven together in the fabric of society? I like to think so. And one of the things that does a lot of that and in the institutions and structures is government, the different ways that we participate in our local community and elections. And this next segment of the program, I'd like to hand it over to Tom B and Zach V who are gonna get into local elections and the work that they've been doing at the neighborhood council level and the West Valley is amazing. It's important, it's impressive. So let's uh, hand it over to Tom and Zach. 
Thank you so much, Ankar. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate uh, being allowed to participate in this space uh, and just really moved by what I heard today earlier by Reverend Ed Eddie. And so um, I just wanted to kind of give some ideas and actually how we can op operationalize some of the thoughts and concepts that we had to have heard it this morning already. Um, one of the ways we can do that, and there's no better way of doing that, is just in your actual in your neighborhood, right? So there's neighborhood council uh, in the West Valley, and there are a variety of ways of getting involved. I have been on the West Hills Neighborhood Council for the last five years, and also am the co-chair of the Homelessness Committee, and we've been really been involved in trying to do this, this work for quite a while through the neighborhood uh, process, neighborhood council process, and we'd like to share some ways to, for everybody to get involved. You know, if our voice is not at the table, then 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 somebody else's voice is taking control of the situation. So I really want to encourage people to get involved, and and we have a little bit of a discussion today from some, uh, you know, Aaron uh, uh, Piper uh, Block, who is the president of the Palms Neighborhood Council, and we also have uh, Zach uh, Vallette, who also was on the Neighborhood Council with me for a while, and we'd like to hear their side and information from their experience. In the neighborhood council but first we like to kind of just kind of make it a, a, a simple way of, of remembering this we want you to run as a, as a candidate right now in the west valley we have open candidacies filing right now currently so all the, the various cities uh neighborhoods in the west valley are open right now i don't i think we have a a, a, a link that we can drop into the chat if someone could do that for me that has a lot of information it's too complex to kind of go over in in a, in a quick brief way now but we want you to, to see what neighborhood council district you live in. We want you to run as a candidate if you can, right? So run as a candidate or try to supply candidates in this, in this really it's every two years. So it's important for us to do this now. We also want you to support the candidates that agree with progressive ideas. And so that's the next step, right? And that's in a couple of months, there'll actually be elections. And so we want you to also support those slates or those individual candidates that support our ideals. And then finally, we want you to continue to participate in neighborhood council uh, activities throughout the entire you know, year and, 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 and continuing so by calling in regularly and being part of that process. They're all uh, on Zoom right now and, and video. Uh, they have to post agendas. And so you can actually read over agendas in advance and you can actually call in on, on things that are on the agenda and actually make a, a, you know, your own case. And, and again, to try to forward the progressive um, agenda that we have. Um, I'd like to call uh, on on Erin Piper Block. Uh, she is the president of the Palms Neighborhood Council and she can give you some ideas on how they actually had made sweeping changes in their neighborhood council structure. So Erin, would you like to speak a little bit about your experience on the Palms Neighborhood Council and how you managed to, in a sense, flip the, uh, the, the uh, the, the, the tone and the sentiment of that entire neighborhood council over the last few years. Erin? Sure, uh, can you hear me? Sure, yes we can. Great, hi everybody, um, I'm Erin and um, again, uh, president of the Palms Neighborhood Council. So I actually uh, definitely don't wanna take credit for flipping the neighborhood council because it, before I um, started, it had already kind of been flipped toward the progressive side, but was like starting at the at ground zero. Um, there were, you know, as you can imagine with neighborhood councils, there was some drama <laughs> and um, the president before me, Nick Greif um, and his uh, executive team really like took over and um, created an incredible foundation for us. Um, so when I came on, um, to the Palms Neighborhood Council, it was um, really uh, starting out well, but um, we didn't have a lot of capacity. And um, so in 2019, when um, elections happened last time, I wasn't planning on running actually, uh, but the person who was planning on running for president was running on kind of like a, um, criminalized the homeless um, platform. It was pretty shocking and um, wasn't, luckily wasn't resonating with the people in our neighborhood. And I just felt like I, you know, had to step up and, and run. So I built a slate. We had, I think 10 people on the slate, um, all of us won. And um, 
we have since just been working really hard to serve the community. Um, I think we do have a <laughs> one of the easier times um, just uh, working with our community because we have a lot of young professionals and a, um, a lot of renters in Palms. So we don't get a lot of the blowback from NIMBY communities that other neighborhood councils get. Um, but we've really been able to just uh, be pretty like radical in our policy statements. Um, we do uh, community impact statements, which are like the neighborhood council policy um, stances to the city council. Um, we do those every month and, um, you know, wrote one saying that we um, supported the people's budget and defunding the police. Um, we uh, are constantly writing CIS motions about um, homelessness and uh, trying to make sure that criminalization doesn't happen. And um, we have also done a lot with the pandemic, just helping um, our community. We called more than 3,000 seniors in our area uh, to check on them and then uh, connect folks with services. And then we've also just uh, donated quite a bit of money to different organizations that are making PPE and all all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think I'll just I'll stop there, but I, I can answer more questions. <laughs> I don't want to just uh, I have so much to say, but don't want to take up too much time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, and so you're also going to get some feedback from someone who actually did their time. Uh, at uh, the West Hills Neighborhood Council. And it is sometimes it can be a really difficult uh, process to be on one of these boards, especially in the West Valley. But again, that's what we have to do. We have to kind of like, it's a, it's a long, it's a long-term commitment and fight. And, uh, and so we have Zach Vallette, who was a colleague of mine and good friend. And uh, he'd uh, like to share a little bit about his experience and some of the things that we can do uh, uh, around the, the, the idea of, of activism within the yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Zach Bullett, he, him, uh, West Valley People Alliance member, former uh, West Hill Neighborhood Council member, as Tom said. Um, first, I just want to thank Reverend Eddie and everyone else who has spoken today. Really great stuff. Um, thanks, Aaron, for sharing your story. Um, <clears throat> I'll be pretty brief because there's a lot of stuff to get to, but um, I just want to focus on how joining an NC can be a really good introduction to understanding sort of the technocratic side of local government. Um, so NCs, short for neighborhood council, obviously, they vary a lot, but generally speaking, they're set up like miniature versions of the Los Angeles City Council. Um, so the way that like motions and resolutions and community impact statements, which Aaron's just mentioned, move through an NC are very similar to the way that motions and resolutions and report backs and stuff like that are moved through the city council. So being on the neighborhood council and being part of that process will definitely help you sort of understand how things are moved at a city level. Um, obviously, there's a lot of politics that goes into that at the city council level that um, sometimes gets mimicked at NC levels, but just on how it you know, the very like nuts and bolts of it. Um, you, I think you learn a lot about that system being on a neighborhood council. Um, also NCs are governed by the Brown Act, which the LA city council is supposed to follow. Um, so it's also sort of a good, very basic introduction to that as far as um, serial communications and, um, you know, quorum issues. So you'll, you'd get exposed to um, sort of some very rudimentary Brown Act stuff too. Um, but the thing that I think uh, when I look back on my time, like the thing that the best thing that I think I learned about was how to sort of use the city clerk's site. Um, so the city clerk's site has all of the council files, which are uh, generated by the Los Angeles City Council. So anytime there's like a motion or a resolution introduced at the LA City Council. Um, once it's introduced the next day, city clerk will create a council file for it. 
and this the city clerk site is also where um, all the community impact statements that Aaron just mentioned before um, where those are stored. So is it okay if I just share my screen really quick? I just want to show, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it says disabled. No. Nope. Kalari, you want to make him a uh, close? Should be able to do it now. Okay, cool. You guys see this? Yes. Okay, so this is the city clerk site. Um, again, this this was kind of like I I look back and this was the most important thing that I learned how to do um, at my time at NC because I was um, on the government relations committee and so we were really focused on looking at council files and. This is where a lot of our community impact statements originated. So off the top of my head, I'll just put in the worst CF I can think of. And here's Bob's motion. Um, you know, this was the criminalizing homelessness. And then, like Aaron said, here are these community impact statements that come from the neighborhood councils. They're all listed in here including any communication from the public, anyone can file one of these. Um, but I also learned, uh, that you can do sort of a little more advanced stuff. Like, let's say I want to look up all the motions that our CD 12 representative staffer B has moved. I can put in um, mover. So that would be John Lee and then from CD 12 and search. And here's everything that he's and then of course, you'll get all of his RV overnight parking bans, which is like the only thing that he actually ever puts forward. So anyway, I, I didn't know anything about this system the council file system LA city clerk at all until I had joined the neighborhood council and you know one of the first sort of meetings I went to they're like oh here's this council file here's this motion and you know if you're not really familiar with it you're like well where does this stuff come from so anyway um, I just want to say I, I think it's a really really good way to learn about sort of the technocratic side of the city council um, and so, you know, if you're looking to get in and under have a better understanding of how the, the city council itself works, I think neighborhood councils are a really good way to pick up that knowledge. So that's, that's really all I had uh, to say. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Susie Shannon and Yasmin Pomeroy to talk about the ADEM uh, elections, which is super important. So go for it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Zach, for that introduction. And thanks, everyone, for being here. I hope everyone's having a good morning, despite the chaos of this week. Um, my name is Yasmin Pomeroy. I'm an educator at El Camino Real Charter High School. I teach 10th and 11th grade English. I am also the co-founder of West Valley Educators for Racial Justice. It is a chapter through UTLA's Racial Justice Task Force that we've opened in the West Valley. Um, as uh, Pilar had mentioned earlier, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this side of our valley. So um, I'm also one of very few educators who launched Black Lives Matter in schools at our school site. And I'm sharing this just as a reminder to us and everyone that there is so much work that's going on behind the scenes. There is so much organizing that goes unnoticed, but we're working really hard and we're getting work done. So on that note, on similar note of organizing, the ADEM elections are coming up and not a lot of people know what the ADEMs are because it's a very small election that usually goes unnoticed, but it's incredibly important. So what the ADEM is, 
it, the acronym is for assembly district delegates. So we would act as delegates who would advise our elected officials on voting on issues, candidates, and policy. So we're elected by Democratic voters within our assembly district where they give the community a direct voice in the Democratic Party. So the ADEM essentially acts as um, our direct democracy where we maintain accessibility at the local level. So it's really important to elect grassroots organizers and community leaders and volunteers in these elections. Those of us who are everyday people who are doing this work, who are working hard to make sure that we have representation and really be the representation for the collective voices for those in our community. So I am part of a really progressive slate, um, the AD45 progressives. Um, we have a handful of our slate members who are with us here today, so thank you those of you who are here. Um, if Chris or Kiyomi can drop the link to our website, that would be awesome. Um, and then one of our Slate members, Michelle. Michelle, are you? I know she said that she was going to step out. Am I here? Awesome. So she's going to chat a little bit more about our Slate and give you any information that I may have missed and then pass it over to Susie. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Yasmin. So yeah, so interestingly enough, the ADEM was was created for grassroots, so we could have a say in the free platform and all of that. Um, and then, you know, we're noticing that there's another slate that's just all staffers, which is not really supposed to happen. And, um, you know, they get a little threatened, and that's okay. It's good to shake things up and down with that. Um, so, you know, one of the, it's, you know, I think we get caught up and I was definitely one of those, if you heard my story earlier, um, that was like, oh, president, okay, I heard of that person, so I'll vote for him or her. Um, and then as far as any down ballot, I was just like, uh, they seem nice, that that was how I voted. And that was not right. <laughs> and then I found out about delegates and I'm like, well, what does that mean? And so, and it's just something that's really not advertising. It's really under the radar. And I think there's probably a reason for that. Um, it's always in um, person. So uh, this year, though, it's been, uh, obviously, we can't go in person. So it's by mail. Now, the, the caveat is, is that you cannot, um, you have to request your ballot even if you are already a permanent absentee voter, you are not gonna automatically request your ballot. So um, in our uh, website, if somebody wants to post that, oh, I think Susie just did. Um, no, that's not it. That's something different. Yeah, there we go, Chris, thank you. And on there, you can find out, first of all, what districts you're in, if you're in District 45, that's the slate that we're running on. We would love to have your endorsement and your vote. If um, you have to be a registered Democrat, so then below that, you can uh, click on the link to sign up to request your ballot. That has to be done by this Monday in two days. Um, so then what you do is you get your ballot and then you come back to our slate and vote for all of us. <laughs> and then you want to get it in the mail no later than like the 19th or the 20th because it has to be received by the 27th. This is really, really important because this is shaping the Democratic Party. So right now we have like a super majority and they're not so hot, right? So they voted against some things that was not good. Um, so we have an opportunity to really face that. And the people um, that are on our slate are ridiculously awesome. And um, it comes from such, we have such a background of um, young people, um, people of color, um, LBGT. Um, it, we have some white people in there too. <laughs> but, um, you know, people that have a breadth of experience, um, but it's just really uh, bringing a, like a fresh perspective to the party. And I, I always say, like, you know, if you want to change the party, you got to do it from within. 
and um, that's what we're doing. So we're super excited. I encourage you guys to look at our, our website and you can read um, on uh, each one of us. We have like a, just a great, like every single person is just A plus. There's no, there's no, uh, like I, I don't look at anybody and be like, eh, <laughs> you know? And I, and I had to be talking to it. I'm like, is this a progressive flight? I like did my full investigation. So I'm super honored to be on this plate and very, very excited. And we have such a good opportunity to really make some progress. So I'm excited about that. And at that point, I will turn it over to our friend, Susie. Where is she? Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a member of the Democratic National Committee. I created the Poverty Council at the DNC. Um, and I also um, have been on the California Democratic Party Executive Board since 2007. Um, so just historically in 2005, a lot of progressives came into the party, um, created the progressive caucus within that party and I'm the immediate um, past um, vice chair for Southern California. Um, so every two years we elect 14 people um, to represent us in each of the assembly districts. We have progressive slates running all over the state of California. A lot of them you can find at progressiveslates.org. Um, as it was uh, stated, you have until Monday actually to request a ballot. If you go to progressiveslates.org or I think any of um, the slates that were listed in the chat, you can find the link actually to go to um, and register with the California Democratic Party. You do have to be a registered Democrat um, when you, sign up with the California Democratic Party to request a ballot. It goes straight into a voter database to make sure that you are a registered Democrat. They will send you a ballot and then you want to mail that ballot in um, as quickly as possible, but definitely by the 20th to the 22nd, it should be received by the California Democratic Party by the 27th. Um, so what do these delegates do? Um, they represent you in the party. They um, support or author resolutions on issues that we care about, like homelessness, like renters' rights, like a Green New Deal, Medicare for All. Now, Medicare for All is in our platform. A lot of these poverty issues are in the platform because progressives have been working on these for a very long time. And I will tell you that Medicare for All was like one of the biggest struggles that we had, and it took us two to three years to get that into the platform. But it's definitely not going anywhere because we've got, uh, I think, a strong force of, of folks um, you know, who are, who are pushing for that. But I will say on the renters' rights um, issues and some of the homeless issues, it's extremely important that we have uh, activists within the party. I mean, I will tell you that my work in the Democratic Party, if it weren't for that, um, I, you know, I, my organization was the, the sponsor for SB 1380, which put the state of California um, on a housing first model for homelessness. That never would have happened had I not been involved with the Democratic Party, had I not been connected with a lot of elected officials. So there is like a, a lot of importance here <laughs> in terms of making sure that all of these issues um, and our advocacy for specific communities are expressed. Um, and so with that, um, uh, I just want to say for you know the resolutions that we pass, for the platform that we pass every two years, which is an expression of our principles as a party. Um, the uh, candidates that we endorse within the party, which is uh, another function of our um, elected delegates, um, it is really important that we have progressives in there. So I'm going to um, direct you again to progressiveslates.org or to any of the individual ADs that you've seen. And I want to also give a shout out to everyone who is running in the 45th on the progressive slate. So that's Renee Grace Rodriguez, who many of you know. Um, uh, and who is also formerly homeless like me. So for me, um, I'm always looking for people who are activists in these communities, but also people with lived experience, which really helps. Um, Kiyomo uh, Kowalski, Michelle Fowle, Avista Helmandi, uh, Victoria Sokovitz, Yasmin Pomeroy, who you heard from as well, um, and Doris Dent. And then for the um, self-identified non-female category, which is another seven, people that you can vote for, Carrie Brown, CJ Barina, Kaysen Fern, Michael Lieberman, Christopher Manabi, Dan McQuarrie, and Greg Sokovic. And then I just want to give a shout out to the 38th, because I know that there's some 
um, overlap here. Um, Ruth Luavano, Luavanos, um, Shawnee Badger, Rebecca Alvarin, Gracie Peckrell, um, Jane Arakawa Fowler, Cassandra Douglas, Ruth Mann, Ankur Patel, who we heard from earlier, um, Cameron Chase Neal, Sebastian Cazares, Sage Rafferty, and Byron Williams. Um, and I do, I think that Kim Olson is also um, on that, that ballot. So please, um, as I said, activists, people with lived experience, diehard progressives, because um, we not only need to keep the very progressive platform that we have, but we do need to move on. Uh, you know, with other very progressive issues and make sure that those are expressed. And we need to make sure that the candidates that we are endorsing within the Democratic Party also reflect those values. But thank you so much. I hope I didn't go over time. And a huge shout out to everyone who's running. I love you all. I'm looking forward to working with you and the party in the next couple of years. Awesome. I think we're going to turn it over now to, um, and thank you so much, everybody. That was, um, I think everyone thought after the Georgia election that we were done with elections, but we're not. <laughs> we get to do more and more and more. Um, so, you know, as everybody stated, I think it's just so important, um, these local elections, and um, we're lucky enough to have some great people who are part of West Valley People's Alliance um, running and building the movement for justice and all of the different corners of uh, West Valley organizing where it needs to happen, which is really exciting. Um, we also wanted to, to just make a connection to the work that we've been doing. Um, um, Pilar? Yeah. The, the, yeah, this is Mike Goldman. I, you know, I raised my hand. I was wondering before you move on from the ADEMS, if I could just speak briefly. Sure, yeah, and we, I should have, um, we have a couple minutes we can ask questions and things like that. If you can well, just- Well, I'm gonna basically post what I'm gonna, you know, the important stuff in the chat again. I've been, been doing it. I just wanna give a shout out to Susie. Susie has been active in the California Democratic Party for a number of years. And although it's still somewhat of a corporate party, she's done a tremendous amount in, with other activists in pushing the party to the left and getting progressive policies passed. I think you should all know that, that you've been very instrumental. Um, what I wanted to say is I'm the co-chapter leader of Progressive Democrats of America, San Fernando Valley chapter. And this Thursday, we're inviting delegates of uh, um, ADD candidates, that's the Assembly District Delegate candidates, in AD 45 and 46 to speak at our meeting and inviting other people to come and hear them. So if uh, any of the candidates uh, want to uh, speak at our meeting or anyone just wants to come and hear them, they should send an email to uh, myself or Teresa Prem. And I'll just post those again in the chat. So I just wanted to point that out. And that's it. Thank you. And okay. I don't know if anyone had questions, anyone's interested in running, wanted to get more information, um, we can connect you up with the right people to answer your questions um, or any other questions for our speakers. And you can always, if people do have questions or wanna find out more, um, you can always, email us at contact at wvpeople.org or DM us through any of our social media. <clears throat> and we can make sure to connect you with folks too because we hope that we will have people who want to get involved. Grace has raised your hand. Okay, Grace. Renee. Mute. There, I'm unmuted now. I just wanted to let people know, and maybe Susie Shannon can clarify this for me, is that the California Democratic Convention, there are caucuses called like the Progressive Caucus, LGBT Caucus, and all those other things. I don't believe you have to be a delegate in order to participate in the caucuses. Am I correct, Susie, on that one? 
Is he still with us? That's true about the Progressive Caucus. So you can attend so the Progressive. You uh, that's true about the Progressive Caucus. You don't have to be a delegate to attend the Progressive Caucus meetings. And I think it might be the I same. Would invite, so with that, I would invite everybody get involved. We've got to put pressure on the leadership to change the party. Um, we really need you there uh, to show up and give support. Yeah. yeah. And if you're a member, Mike, isn't it true that you can vote as well? I'm pretty sure, you just yeah. just can't vote at the general assembly. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, um, sorry about that, my phone froze. So I was like frantically trying to unfreeze it. Um, yes, anyone can get involved. So uh, in 2005, we added poverty issues to our platform. I was not even a delegate then. I just had come in uh, as someone's um, proxy because um, somebody who's elected just couldn't make it to the meeting. Um, and I was like up in arms because the platform didn't include anything on poverty issues or homelessness. So you can make a huge difference in the party even without being a delegate. So if you run and you don't win for some reason, um, which hopefully with the place that we mentioned, they're all going to win. Um, if, if that's the case, you can still make a difference and you can also appeal to your um, elected delegates as well to bring stuff forward. Um, if it has to be like brought forward by an executive board member. I did forget to ask to, to, uh, to mention too that the highest, the rules have changed a little bit this time around. And now it's the highest vote getter who wants to be an executive board member will now get the executive board seat, where in the past, somebody had to designate that in advance, and then we just had an election for those candidates. Um, now it's going to be the highest vote getter for the delegate will also get an e-board seat. And we, we will get one e-board seat for all um, 80 assembly districts um, coming up. And a lot of that work, like when the party endorsed Proposition 21, it was the executive board that made that decision. So that is also extremely important. Great. So that's the Democratic Party and the local rundown. Um, Pilar has already gone over our racial uh, or our committees. I don't know if you wanted to make another pitch for it. Uh, we'll drop the link again. Please sign up for these committees. And we are, you know, at 1120, we still got another very important section. Uh, should I just get it, get into it? Yeah. So next we have Kim Olson, right? She's been amazing as part of the rapid response, just active in the West, uh, West Valley in so many ways. It's uh, through this work that we met and it's a pleasure to continue to meet wonderful people like this who are willing to do the work on the ground, show up, put their time and effort and their hearts into it. Kim, tell us what you've been working on and, and try and get these people involved in your work as well, please. Hi, um, I think a lot of people on here already know my pitch. <laughs> so please forgive me for repeating myself. Um, we are hoping to get some more people out to help us with monitoring some of these sweep zones. For those of you who don't know what sweeps are, it is forcibly removing unhoused folks from their homes, taking their tents, taking their belongings, forcing them out of places where they have sometimes been living for years. Uh, one of the things that we do is we have a rapid response group, and I would encourage people to sign up for this. Um, very specifically, there is a special enforcement cleaning zone in Van Nuys, um, and one of our members, Carla Orendorf, organizes this on a weekly basis. We have people come out on Thursday to monitor and document what is happening to our in-house folks. So if you have the ability to come out at any point in time. Sometimes helping us is really just like even amplifying when we're saying, hey, we need people out here or amplifying us to uh, local public officials and also educating the people around you. Um, if you're not sure, we will train you. We are happy to bring you in, come out with us, just come out for a couple of hours one day and see if it's something that appeals to you. Um, sometimes it's really hard because you're documenting things that you know are wrong and you need, and it needs to change. The only way we're going to change these things is to bear witness. Sometimes, um, there are times too, that we get involved in other actions where we will, um, we will be involved in blockades and things like that to help 
protect our unhoused folks. So, you know, you can be involved as much or as little as you like. Uh, we also have Sunday, we have outreach program where we reach out to somewhere between 350 to 500 unhoused folks in the West San Fernando Valley. We bring out food, always food, sometimes hygiene kits uh, lately. Um, thank you, Pilar. We talked about doing an Amazon wish list, and she actually threw it up there on that horribly rainy night where um, we actually had temperatures that could have caused, caused hypothermia. Um, so the wish list went up, and people from all over LA, all over the city, donated, I don't know, like at this point, it may be almost 200 items, tents, tarps, socks, mittens, uh, hats, flashlights. My house is a zoo. <laughs> it's completely insane. Um, Renee Grace, oh my gosh, she has let us use her office and you can't walk in the waiting room because there are boxes everywhere that we have to pile out every day. The postwoman hates us. Um, but the good news is our unhoused folks have winter survival items. Um, we had a slew of them go out last Sunday. We're gonna have a whole bunch go out this Sunday. It's not going to be enough. What happens here in the West Valley is the sun beats down on the tents and the tarps that people have. So when these first rains come, it just goes pouring in. You, all of the holes, all of the sun damage, it all gets tried with the wind and the rain and they're gonna need more. So if someone could throw, oh, Pilar, thank you, threw up the wish list. If you guys have the ability um, to donate survival items, that would be amazing. We were able to go out with survival items and hot meals, um, 250 hot meals on Christmas Eve. A whole bunch of people who have never even been involved before came forward, made hot meals and brought them to the Hindu temple, which is now hosting our outreaches on Sundays, which is amazing. Thank you, Ankur, for the introduction. Um, so, we were able to bring out mittens, gloves, actually someone donated brand new shoes, like homemade cupcakes, hot meals, uh, macaroni and cheese, fried chicken, like you name it, whatever was on people's tables, they threw together another 10, 20, I think Zach threw together like 50, something crazy. And um, everybody showed up and we got the meals out that day. If you guys would like to be involved in outreach programs like that, we meet every Sunday. We're meeting at the Hindu temple at one o'clock. If, um, if you need the address, I'm sure we can throw it up here in the chat. And Pilar, whatever I missed, I know you'll cover me. <laughs> I think that was perfect. The only thing I would add is just, um, you know, I think bringing it back to what Reverend Eddie was talking about, um, you know, working around housing and homelessness, um, you know, homelessness obviously is the most extreme form of poverty. And that's something that, um, you know, we've really prioritized as an organization to stand up and fight to change. Um, and so, you know, again, the more the merrier in this, um, it's been really amazing to build a community of folks who go out every Sunday and, um, you know, care for our neighbors. And when we were doing um, Christmas Eve outreach, my car actually died and the folks who I had just brought meals to came out and jumped my car, <laughs> helped me get going. Um, so we call it mutual aid for a reason. Um, we're really helping each other and supporting each other. And um, it's, uh, you know, we have to solve this because um, our leaders, unfortunately, are not stepping up in the way that they need to at this moment uh, and during this crisis where we know a wave of evictions are coming. Um, and so we, uh, you know, the more we build a louder, stronger voice to fight for just solutions, um, you know, the, the bigger difference that we can make. And we really have been able to make a difference. We've been able to stop the criminalization efforts um, through, you know, working with a network of Los Angeles um, activists and um, leaders that Bob Blumenfield, Council Member Blumenfield had been moving, um, which, you know, would have been horrific in the middle of winter. And, um, but there's more to be done. Sweeps are happening despite CDC recommendations. They shouldn't be. And despite this huge spike in COVID, it's unconscionable that people are being swept and moved and displaced and shelters being taken out from under people. Um, so we need to do more. And um, we hope that you'll join us to do that. Um, 
you know, I've dropped a couple times the link to sign up. You can sign up for our committees for rapid response there. Um, and just want to, you know, encourage folks. I know a lot of people here are involved in a bunch of different things. Um, it's a way to, you know, stay in touch with us. We email out to our committees important things that are going on that we don't send to the general email list. So if you can come to some meetings and not come to some meetings, um, you know, we all understand that folks step up when they can and step back when they can't and hopefully you know it all balances out in the end um and so we hope that you'll join us and be a part of it um and really you know feel empowered to make a difference in the west valley because we see already the difference that we're making the narrative is changing the you know um, we john lee is supporting housing for unhoused neighbors <laughs> <laughs> for God's sake. So um, if that doesn't say something. Um, so we, you know, we just are excited to have you all with us today because we know this was a, a hard week, a hard discussion to have and um, appreciate Encore and everyone who was a part of the program to help us um, refocus, re-energize and, and get ready to make 2021 way better than 2020 was, even though it's off to a rough start. Um, <laughs> we're, we're counting on it. Um, so thank you so much. And Ankur, I don't know if you wanna add anything at the end too. No, that was perfect, Pilar. Beautiful sentiment to end on. We're right at 1130. We appreciate everyone joining us. This was a great meeting. It was my privilege to facilitate. I hope I did an okay job. Thank you all for being on. Uh, See you at one of the committee meetings, hopefully. I'm actually going to go protest Mike Garcia right now, uh, that Yay. traitor. So <laughs> everyone does what they can, when they can, where they can. Glad to be a part of it with you.